Matthew 28. And this is one of the greatest chapters of victory in all of the Bible. When you heard my text, uh, you would probably assume that I'm not an evangelist, but I'm a missionary. Because every missionary has a Matthew 28 text, a sermon that they preach. This is a very, very victorious chapter, and I'm delighted to share it with you because it has some very odd words in this particular chapter. In an otherwise victorious chapter in the Bible, there's some odd words here. Uh, This is such a familiar chapter of victory that you and I could probably quote the very first verses in this chapter. Look at chapter 28 of Matthew. And then look at verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the the stone from the door, and he sat upon it. Look at verse 6. Listen to these words. Uh, We can put these on the mantle of our living room. Here it is. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. We know this by heart. At the end of the Sabbath, here it is, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then look at the very end. This should be even more familiar. Look at the last phrase of the last verse. Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. It's a chapter of resurrection, of revelation, of great commission. Which is why there are three words in this chapter that just don't fit. Amidst all the glory, the hope, and promise, and faith, there's a very powerful reminder to us tonight. We're going to see three powerful truths for all of us here and about the God that you and I serve. Okay, what are those three words? Well, look at verse 16, just before the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee and into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. But some doubted. This is an amazing chapter. And then you see three words of doubt. The 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Wait a minute. We're talking about the 11 that had already seen the resurrected Christ in person, having heard and known of all of his promises to rise. On the third day, with all of this happening exactly as he said, of course they rejoiced. Of course they fell at his feet and worshipped him. But some, some of the eleven doubted. The disciples were looking face to face at the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they still doubted. Doubted what? Doubted why? They seem out of place in this glorious text, but they're there. Why are these three words in our text? Because the Bible is not written by man. It's written by God. If I were Matthew, I would not have included, (laughs) but some doubted. And they're there for us. They're going to teach and admonish us tonight about what it means to serve God or what it takes to be equipped to serve God. There's three things I want us to consider in the light of this remarkable text. These disciples who doubted or hesitated or faltered, call it whatever you want. There are a lot of teachers, a lot of preachers as of this moment who have had moments of doubt. There's not anybody who I've known who has had great faith ascribed to their descriptions, who hasn't gone through a moment of doubt. This word, doubthead, is the same word used when 
Peter's walking across the water, and then he starts to sink, and then he says, Jesus, words in red, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Same word. It's the exact same word. Now, this doubt is not unbelief. They're seeing him. Unbelief is in verse 13, 14, and 15. Look at verse 13, 14, and 15, saying, say ye. Okay, say this. This is the company line. This is what we want to go with. Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. That's unbelief. This is not doubt. That's, they just didn't believe it. It's nevertheless a moment of uncertainty, a faltering, whatever you want to call it. The disciples can't fully grasp what they're seeing with their eyes. And there's three lessons. Number one, there's a lesson of patience. There's a lesson of patience tonight. The Lord promised his disciples. He prophesied. He predicted that after three days, he would rise from the grave. Not only did he promise to rise from the grave, he proved it by raising Lazarus from the dead. Evidence, facts, proof, even the enemies of Jesus knew about this promise. Look across the page in the previous chapter, chapter 27, and look at verse 62. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate. Okay, that one verse lists all the enemies of Jesus Christ. And the enemies of Jesus Christ knew about the promise. Look at the next verse. Look at verse 63, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. The enemies knew it. The disciples certainly knew about the promise and prediction of his resurrection. They were very concerned, the enemies of God, about this resurrection. Look at chapter 28, verse 5, please. The angel of the Lord answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples. Okay, they knew too that he was risen. They had eyewitness accounts that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Look at verse 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Not only do they have all the promises, not only do they have the proof, but now you see him in person. Here he is. They're touching him right before their eyes. What does verse 9 say? They held him by the feet. What are now on his feet? His wounds. They see him. They feel him. And then he was going to appear to them in Galilee. So why the disbelief? Why the hesitation? They worshipped him, but some still doubted. Now, I'm pretty sure that if you or I were God, that we might exercise some divine retribution at this point. How much evidence do you need? How much proof? How, how, much, how many facts do we need to finally be convinced that Christ is alive? We shouldn't automatically presume that we would do any better in this test or that we would be any more faithful in believing than the 11 disciples. So take a moment of self-reflection. Did not the Lord promise you that he'd give you eternal life that began at your faith in him? So why do you have moments of doubt when there's chaos, when there's disease or sickness or death or a pandemic? Did our Lord promise to take care of all of our needs, every need supplied? And hasn't he done it? Look back. Hasn't he done it all these years? Has he been faithful to you just like he said? 
So why the fear? The stock market, a looming recession, the value of a dollar. Does the Lord have complete control over our lives? He sure does. Should we trust him no matter what the circumstances are? But we doubt, but we have no reason to doubt. The 11 saw with their eyes the risen Savior, but some doubted. And it's a lesson in patience. Our Lord has been patient with us. Aren't you glad for the long-suffering nature of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? He's been long-suffering with me. We're given that proof that he was patient in in the next words. Look at verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them. Oh, if it were me, you'd be hearing, and Jesus came and smoked them (laughs) and rebuked them. This is another reminder that regardless of our fears, our frailties, our feelings, our foolishness, God is patient with us. Psalm 103 says it this way, for he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it's gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Father still loves his children. Does that mean God will excuse our faltering faith? No, there's always consequences to doubt. It's a self-inflicted wound, if you will. Doubt and unbelief are not the same thing. He looks at his children as children. Aren't you thankful for that? I look at my children as children. I don't expect them to be professionals. I don't expect them to be grown adults. Aren't you glad that God does that the same way with us? These are a bunch of boys. All these guys didn't know what to do. They were boys without a dad or a leader. Uh, This is an excerpt from a book called Bringing Up Boys. In the seventh grade, the biology teacher had us dissect little pigs. My friends and I pocketed the snout of a pig and stuck it on the water fountain so that the water shot straight through the pig's nostrils. No one noticed until they bent over to get a drink. The problem started when we wanted to stick around and see the results. We started laughing so hard, so we got caught and got the paddle. This is from another man. A friend and I found a coffee can of gasoline in a garage and decided to pour some down a manhole and light it and see what happened. We'd pop the manhole open, pour some gas in, and replace it so it was like a jar. They kept throwing matches down, but nothing happened, so they poured all the gas in. Finally, there was a noise like a jet engine starting up. Then a big boom! The manhole cover flew up, and flames shot 15 feet in the air. The ground rumbled like an earthquake, and the manhole cover crashed 12 feet away in the neighbor's driveway. What happened was the gas ran down the sewer lines for a block and vaporized with all the methane, blew up all the neighbor's toilets. The story ends by saying, today I'm a plumber. (laughs) It's just boys being boys, I suppose. Plato once wrote, of all the animals on earth, a boy is the most unmanageable. When I was 12 years old, I was given the keys to our 1988 Chevrolet Celebrity Station Wagon with the Eurosport package. I was given the keys to bring the groceries in, but I was not satisfied with my task. I put the keys in the ignition, fired it up, and started revving on the gas. Ooh, I wanted to hear the engine purr. I was not content with that. I reached down to the gear column, put it in drive, but I reached down to what I thought was the brake, and I stepped on the gas again, and I launched into the bottom two panels of our garage. Boom! Shocked at what I'd done, I reached back to the gear lever, tried to put it in park. It didn't go to park. It went into neutral. I ran out of the car into the house, screaming, I'm sorry, 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 I'm sorry. 
My mom said, sorry for what? I crashed the car into the garage. You what? I crashed the car into the garage. My mother calmly went out to the car, got in the driver's seat, drove the car from out of the street back into the driveway because it had rolled out, put it in park, and then she told me what everyone hates to hear, wait till your dad gets home. Well, when my dad came home, my dad, who is sitting in our services this morning, I looked across from him. He understood what I'd done. And then he said, you're no longer a Johnson. You've got to pack up your bags. And now you are disowned, and you've got to find another family to live with. No, he didn't say that to me. I did get a punishment, well-deserved. Did have to pay for the damage that I'd caused. But then there was forgiveness. Then there was reconciliation. Then there was a hug. Then it was a story, and then we moved on. My dad didn't disown me, and God hasn't disowned you. The love of the Father is a patient love. He's omnipotent. And when these people appeared on the mountain and they still doubted, what would I have done? Probably not what the Lord Jesus did. He didn't, rebuke them, he didn't rebuke them at all or turn them into crispy critters or pillars of salt. He spake unto them. That's what, that's what our Savior did, which leads us to our second powerful truth tonight. What did he speak to them? Look at chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them. What did he speak? Saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. How important is that? Verse 19, go ye therefore. Therefore go because all power is given to me. We see the absolute authority of Jesus Christ, don't we? You can go into the world to every creature and preach the gospel because you've been empowered to do so. Why did God... The Lord Jesus used these doubters because it's not about them or the level of their faith. It's all about his power. Little doubts, no doubts, little faith, great faith, it doesn't matter. Obey his word and go into all the world and do the will of God with God's power. Put it to you this way. If you had to come up with a spiritual dream team of faith giants... You wouldn't start at the tiny little region of Galilee and you wouldn't take this unpopular gospel message to the ends of the world, to every creature, if you had to start with 11 people, with some people that doubted. These 11 people would eventually turn the world upside down, but would you have started with a fisherman or a tax collector or any of these people who were still wavering in their faith? If this were a baseball team and it's this close to opening day, some of these guys wouldn't have made the cut. If this were golf and it were Friday, they certainly would have missed the cut. Still doubts at this point? They've seen the resurrected, powerful Lord. And it's to these 11 that they gave the great commi- he gave the great commission. It's, about, it's the great commission because it's about the greatness of the one who gave it not the ones who received it. He's patient. He's powerful. And he is powerful enough to give you all power to raise godly children. He can give you all power to defeat the discouragement that Satan brings, to win a soul, to build a home, to glorify God, to make a difference, to be a blessing here at Arise Baptist Church, to build a testimony And to build the kingdom of God. God wants to use you in spite of you. Brother Johnson, I don't think I can. You're right. You can't. But all power is given to Christ. Do what he says. And you can. Jesus looked at these men who doubted. And probably still doubted. As they're getting this great commission. And if you and I were to look at 
these individuals, you would have said these guys are hopeless. And they are hopeless without Christ. But Christ has given them the power. He says, with me, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. How can I please God? How can I do his will or finish my race? How can I keep the faith that's been entrusted to me? You can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. This all power is given to you by Christ himself. The final words given by Jesus in the Great Commission were a divine appointment. He told the disciples to gather at this specific place. Look at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. It's, there was an appointment. He told them where to go, where to meet. Wait a minute. He told them to go to a specific mountain. In Galilee, they went from Jerusalem back to their hometown. Not the holy city. Nope. Back to where, where they met. Judas was one from the temple. Judas was one that was in Jerusalem, but here these are to go back to where it all started, Nazareth, Capernaum, where they were raised as kids and probably rode their bikes and caused shenanigans or whatever. Jesus said it was a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. So why does he send them back to their own country? Let me put these men to the test. Go home. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth, this appointed place, come out of Galilee? Jesus wants to remind his sons and his daughters that all power is given to him. In heaven and in earth, it's his, it's his power that will allow them to do great things. I love to read biographies of people of great faith. I've read scores of them. And what do you find almost always that... Men of great faith, women of great faith, did not always have great faith. You ever read Hebrews chapter 11? That roll call of the heroes of the faith? Why is laughing Sarah there? Why is Lot there? Samson. Jacob, Esau, Jephthah. Why are they in the hall of faith? I'll tell you why. It's not their faith that gives them the power. It's God and His power. God did great things through them and often in spite of them. So we see a lesson of patience. God has been patient with us. We see a lesson of power. And number three, we see a lesson of promise. Look at verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even until the end of of the world. I'm commanding you, Jesus said, to teach the gospel, baptize the ones that get saved, and then teach them to do that same thing. He didn't say, lo, you'll be with me always. It's a matter of truth uh, that we're studying here tonight is that at the moment that they're on the mountain, they didn't know how long they would see each other. Jesus tells them, lo, I am with you always. The promise is that he's going to be with us to the end of the world. There were some doubters, and Jesus promised to be with those doubters until the end of the world. You know, faith is something that you grow into. Faith is something that you exercise. Faith is something that builds throughout your entire life. So we have the patience of God, the power of God, and the promise of God. And He does all of these things over time and through His Word and through what we see in verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost empowering them. How many of you have ever heard of William Cooper? William Cooper wrote one of my favorite hymns. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. What a great promise of victory. He actually worked 
with John Newton to develop hymns like Amazing Grace and, and other hymns. But he was a man who struggled with great despair. He's a great Christian. And he, was, he worked as the personal chaplain for King George II. But none of that brought him any comfort. He was respected in the secular world as well as the religious world. William Wordsworth called him the greatest poet of our day. Gladstone wrote that he wrote the greatest poem ever written by man. He was known as a great poet, but that didn't alleviate his despair. Fame is not going to alleviate your despair. Money's not going to do it. Position won't do it. And so this downcast soul only found victory in this phrase of this verse. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And that's a promise for us today. He's with us always. That promise will wake you up rejoicing tomorrow. It'll wake you up 10 years from now or whatever age you are. And when you're facing death, it'll keep you rejoicing as you enter in to those pearly gates. Three words that kind of ruin the story, but some doubted. If you wanted the Hallmark version or the prosperity version or the cult version, you might leave those three words out. But God is writing this truth. The disciples were ordinary men who needed to grow in their faith, not faith in themselves or their abilities, their strengths, their gifts, or not even faith in their faith. Their faith needed to grow in Christ. Jesus commanded them to go into the uttermost part of the world, whether they doubted or not. Whether their faith met the power or not. Their doubts subsided in the very next verse. Because it's a verse about promise. Lo, I am with you always. The promise of God's power, the ability to do all of those things, the authority, the presence is promised to the very end. And it starts right there in Galilee. God is in the business of doing great things with ordinary people, Amen. with an ordinary church, even people in the midst of that ordinary church that doubt. Hear his, vo hear his voice today. Listen to his word. There are some people in this room that Satan is looking at and saying, look at them. Look at their doubt. They might, he might cause you to slow down or quit or just give up the whole thing. Be discouraged about obeying his word. This is an amazing promise. Lord, we believe. Help thou our unbelief. Take God at his word and God will help your unbelief. You want to obey, excuse me, you want to have that unbelief fade away? Obey His Word. Don't quit coming to church. Don't stop reading the Word of God. Don't stop getting on your knees and praying for your friends and your families. There are commands for you as a mother, as a wife, as a husband, as a father, as grandparents, and for all of us as believers. We may still have moments of doubt. But are you better than Matthew? Are you better than Luke or John? But I have these doubts, Brother Johnson. So did the disciples that saw the resurrected Lord. Even in the midst of worshipers, there are doubters. They fell at their feet, at his feet, and worshiped him. You can come to church with some doubts. You can look at your job or your situation. You can have some doubts. But then, leave those doubts at an altar like this, get up, worship the Lord again, obey His word, go out with the gospel, bring another one under the sound of the gospel, point people to Jesus, and God will find you growing in your faith. I have no doubt that the thief on the cross probably didn't have 100% faith when he's tossed up a Hail Mary, even though Mary was there. And said, hey, remember me when you go into the kingdom. He didn't have all the right words, did he? 
But the Lord said, today you'll be with me in paradise, doubts or no doubts. Some of the greatest prophets in all of scripture ask questions like, why or how long? I'm reminded of Revelation chapter 6. The martyrs were standing around the throne looking at Jesus, asking the question, how long until there's judgment? How long until there's justice? Now, you and I are not martyrs quite yet. We're still breathing. The blood's still pumping. And we have not given the ultimate sacrifice for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But even those that had and still wondered why or how long, Jesus is in charge of that still. And he says, all shall be fulfilled. And who's the one that's doing the fulfilling? It's the one who knows the end from the beginning. Your faith is not, is not demonstrated by your faith. It's demonstrated in God's power. We sang about John the Baptist. And even the greatest born among women doubted. Listen to this. Matthew 11, verses 3 through 6. And said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we seek another? Jesus answered and said unto him, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. More proof upon prophecy, upon promise. And the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And he is blessed, whosoever shall not be offended in me. If you respond with disobedience, you'll have more doubt. But if you respond in faith, the Lord will give you the strength that will take you all the way to the end of the earth. Your faith is not measured by your power. It's measured by God's power and what he's doing through you. The Lord has been long-suffering to us. We see his patience. He's given us all power, and we see this wonderful promise that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. I don't know what the Lord is speaking to you about today, but I know that your faith, even the faith the size of a mustard seed, can be strengthened here tonight. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. No one's looking around. I want to pray for you. What's the solution to little faith? Ask him for it. Ask him for big faith. I don't know what circumstances you find yourself in, but I can assure you, the more you look at your circumstances, the more you will be discouraged. Brothers and sisters in Christ, today, your faith can be increased. And the Lord can do something great in you through Christ's power. So here's the question. Do you have that faith? Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? The one who died for you, was buried, and then rose again for you? He is the resurrection and the life. We have no power. He has all power. Will you trust him today by faith? Belief is knowing in your head, faith is resting in that belief. Will you come to Jesus Christ tonight? And if you haven't been saved or you're not sure, will you come right down this aisle, talk to the pastor, talk to another seasoned believer, and we could be glad to show you how you can be on your way to heaven and that your faith has found a resting place in Christ. Brethren, are you doubting tonight? The disciples, the ones that turned the world upside down, had moments of doubt. What are you doing with that doubt? Is your doubt growing right now? Here's what we ought to do with our doubt. Confess it to the Lord. There are consequences to doubt. And let the Lord strengthen you. Let him empower you tonight to do exactly what the Lord has called you to do. We've been given a commission as a Rise Baptist Church to take the gospel to the uttermost part of the planet. And he wants to do it through you, if you'll let him. I'm going to pray for you. Is there anybody here that say, would say, I'm not saved or I'm not sure? Brother Johnson, as you pray, 
Would you pray for me? Is there anybody like that? Slip your hand up. No one's looking around. If you say, I'm not saved or I'm not sure, slip your hand up good and high. One person raised their hand. Is there somebody else? I'm not saved. I'm not sure. I want to put my faith in something that will never change Jesus Christ. He died for me. Christian, if you've doubted, there's strength for you. You say, Brother Johnson, this is a good reminder for me tonight. Would you pray for me? Is there anybody like that? Hands all over the room. Anybody like that? I need my faith strengthened tonight. Would you pray for me? Okay, you can put your hands down. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word that didn't hide these three little words, but some doubted. Lord, thank you so much for the power that we see that you give to disciples. And it's not up to our faith or our level of faith. You give it according to your power. You've empowered Jesus, and Jesus has empowered us. Lord, thank you for this wonderful promise. Lord, as we go out of these doors, Lord, help us to remember that you've given us all the power that we'll ever need until the end of the world. Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit that does your work in us from the inside out. Thank you for your word that gives us this promise. We ask this in Christ's name.